October 17th, and it is a brand new episode of Let There Be Talk, and we have a fantastic guest today. Cesar is here, the president and CEO of Gibson, the man that has uh, spearheaded the comeback and the dream team known as the Murphy Lab. Right here today, a deep guitar dive on Let There Be Talk. Before I get into it, let's give a shout out to some of the new Patreoners. George Mashoutis. <laughs> I fucked your name up for sure. Sorry. George Mashoutis. Joe Grippo. Christopher Diane. And Stephen Wright. Those are the new Patreoners. Thank you. Join the Patreon at patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey for bonus episodes and live Zoom hangs. And also, all my tour dates are at deandelray.com, including November 11th, which will be the Madison Square Garden with the mighty Mr. Bill Burr, and uh, Irvine Improv, December, what is that, the 20th, I believe, headline in that one. Lots of show dates up there all over America. Hollywood, Florida's coming up. Atlanta, Georgia. Go to the website, deandelray.com. So, if you've been listening to this show for about 12 years, you know I am an absolute guitar freak. I am not a great player, and I actually barely play these days because of my mad love of stand-up comedy. But... There's nothing that stops me in my tracks more than a great watch or a mid-century house or a Gibson 59 Les Paul, especially if they're uh, done by my man, Tom Murphy. And uh, Cesar sits down with me today in his busy-ass fucking schedule of running the entire juggernaut known as Gibson and also now Mesa Boogie. And I believe Kramer. I didn't get into Kramer guitars with him. I think they acquired Kramer and have been bringing back those amazing guitars. I could be wrong on that. But I do know one thing. I love Gibsons and I love talking about them. And no better man to talk to them than Cesar himself. And you might have seen him over the last few years, maybe jumping on stage with a band here or there or uh, deep involvement with the reissues of the 59 Greeny with Kirk Hammett, uh, or the Adam Jones Silver Burst reissues, all of that. He has his hands deep in the soil, as they kind of say, in the business. And uh, it was great to talk to him. Thank you so much, my man. And thank you, everybody, for nerding out with us today on Let There Be Talk episode 700 what is this i think it's 19 719 i love all of you keep the candles lit enjoy the ride let's go here we are all right here we are another episode of let to be talk fantastic guest today introduce yourself my friend what's up dean this is cesar president and ceo of gibson yeah, man. Uh, where are you at? Is that your office? Yeah, this is my office in Nashville, Gibson HQ, where we make uh, everything happen. Is that above the uh, store downtown I went to? Yeah, this is in the same building where the Gibson garage that you came to is. Yeah. Wow. What a, what a cool room, man. Uh, it was good seeing you out there at the uh, power trip. Man, what a great, that weekend was such an amazing experience. I know for you, as a fan of all the bands, um, same for me, growing up, learning how to play pretty much every single band's songs from all those six bands, and then to have them all as a fan and to be rocking out there with some band members of the different bands, with you in the snake pit, that was the coolest experience that i've had in a very long time yeah it was really really wild i didn't hear anything negative the only thing i heard negative was from people that didn't go you know how those people are they sit on the couch and they go ah fuck that and then really yeah. inside they're like ah, i wish i was there you know <laughs> i the moment it got announced. I had been working with the organizers. They had, you know, we, we did a, a couple of things with them. And so 
the moment I knew about it, when it got announced, I immediately set everything up and changed my schedule to be there because this is one of those moments. I hope it happens every year, but the first one is always going to be the most special one. I didn't want to miss it. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, interesting when you look out there and you think about, you know, uh, for for one thing, I look at uh, Slash as really somebody that really uh, kind of saved Gibson back in the day of the uh, 80s when Charvels and Jackson were absolutely dominating the playing field. Here was a guy who was coming out full old school and playing uh, Les Pauls and not even real ones at the time, you know, a Max or that other one that he had. And uh, it was it really put the uh, classic back into rock, you know, like every, all of a sudden everybody was like, oh, yeah, I need to get me a Les Paul. I, I had talked to Albert at one point at Guitars R Us back in the 90s, and he said he was trading Charvels for 59s like they were just, you know, throwaway guitars. It's an amazing story. Yeah, Albert was one of those early guys who recognized these guitars are special, especially the, the collector 59s that you're talking about. I got my one of my 59 birth Gemini here with me. The That era was incredible, and I think... I couldn't agree more with you when Slash came out and the image at the time without social media that he had to go find who's this, you know, who's this Guns N' Roses band, who's the guitarist, they sound epic. And then you see the image of Slash with his Derek appetite for destruction, we call it Les Paul. I think that changed everything for us. Yeah, and, and simultaneously, it's funny to think about how Slash is playing a fake Les Paul 59. And at the same time, Headfield's playing a fake V, the Electra one, you know, from Japan. So it's wild to even think about that, that they're putting these guitars on the map and they were just, you know, quote unquote, uh, copy guitars. It's wild. And it's, and it's what they could get at the time. If you right. think about it, go back to the maybe the early days for you and for me growing up and what we could afford, what we couldn't afford. And for James was that, that white V that he's had forever that it's a, uh, it feels like home to him. It's his most, you know, most play definitely gets the most stage time. Slash doesn't use his Derek uh, replica anymore. He, that guitar stays in the studio. And when he, when he goes out, obviously he takes all of the things that we make for him. Uh, Slash doesn't even normally take any vintage instruments with him on the road because he really beats them up. He uses them down to the core. He's always using his rig, um, which is what makes maybe on a, on a related but different note, Kirk so interesting playing Gemini every single night on stage with Metallica playing oh, uh, Green. Hey, sorry, Greeny. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it's. Right, so did I opened for Metallica a couple of years ago uh, doing comedy on their 40 year, and I got to slip into the uh, into the area where the guitars were, and his tech was showing me. And apparently, he scored a couple more of those copy V's. And I've been trying to find one for years. You know, I don't know where he found them, but when you when you have like a network like uh, Metallica, you can just be like, hey, in Japan, put the word out. I'm looking for a couple more of these because it looked like he had three when I was looking at him. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. I don't I uh, I I don't know. We, we did make for Kirk. We made several greeny replicas. As yeah, part of that yeah. And now we've got him on the price list in the custom shop made as a made to order. Uh, so he's got he's got a couple, but he always defaults back to playing Greeny on stage. He's always he's got the backups that we made for him, but he's always playing Greeny. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you have that kind of money, I believe in uh, play the real ones. You know, uh, if I own that guitar, I wouldn't be able to play it because at any point I might have to sell it to survive. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, that's the type of mentality I have you know, sell everything you have to buy the one Holy grail piece and hold on to it as long as you can, you know, at least 
Yeah. It, it brings you a little inspiration at the time in your life, you know? Oh, I think for me is, is that something that's very relevant? I mean, clearly here you have my 59 called Gemini, that is the twin sequential serial number to Greeny, and we did a whole story with Kirk about it, uh, which is my number one go-to. And then I was able to get my hands on, and I know how, how big of an ACDC fan you are, and by the way, the, the Let There Be Talk modified to For Those About to Talk was pretty epic. Yeah, um, I love that one. But this is a this is the actual first SG we ever made, July of 1960. This shape doesn't come out until 1961. Uh, this is the first one documented, and I was able to get my hands on it and and keep it in my personal collection. And so, like you said to me, having these special pieces, especially in the context of my role, uh, is is something that really inspires me. Just having them around plugging them in every once in a while in between meetings and using them as test references for the things that we're doing in the custom shop is something that I really cherish. Yeah. For me, uh, like I couldn't afford uh, a good guitar for years. And then I got some uh, job landscaping and the first SG I got, of course, was because of Angus was called the SG. They made those Walnut ones, the Les Paul and the SG. And then the following year, they called them Firebrand, where they branded into the headstock. They had these dirty finger pickups. They were they were the cheap uh, SG and Les Paul you could get because they were trying to compete with like Seville and Memphis uh, that were doing these Japanese copies. And I had it and I just fucking loved it. And now those are even kind of cool to me when I see them. I'm like, whoa, the SG, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I know you're right. I remember. I forgot about those. Yeah, those are those are classic. My buddy just got one, Greg from the Mother Hip. Somebody gave him the Les Paul, and uh, I was like, "Wow, man!" And they're weird when you play them for a long time. The walnut starts to shine up uh, in spots yep. where your arm is. So that's really weird looking, you know? Yeah. That's yeah, absolutely. My my love of uh, Gibson, of course, starts way young when I'm a, a kid and all the big stars had him. Joe Perry, of course, Jimmy Page being my all time God and Angus and, you know, all of these guys were playing. And that stuff was just all around in the music stores back before, you know, they were even vented. They were just, you know, oh, there's a Les Paul. Cool. Two fifty. And you bought it. You know, it's a it's a whole different animal now. I'm not quite sure of your history of when you started. Did you used to work at Levi? Was that you? No, no, I came from. Uh, so I came to Gibson through the ownership group. Um, my background was 22 years of private equity, buying companies, maybe just to put it in simple words, just you know, it's looking at companies that could be acquired to be turned around if they got had gone themselves into trouble in some form or another, or it was a good moment for a particular company to go into the next phase, maybe of growth or international expansion. And that's been my background for 22 years. And But on the other hand, I've been a musician all my life. I started playing when I was 10 years old. I always wanted a Gibson and I couldn't afford it And until... One day I could, and since since then, I mean, I could afford only one guitar, and then over time, as I started working, I could buy my second guitar, and like that, I started putting together a, a, a collection. I played with multiple bands. I recorded for other bands. I've made my instruments available to bands that are recording in the studios. Today, I have about, and this is before joining Gibson, about 150 Gibsons or so in my collection, a lot of vintage stuff. It still gets used. It's been used in the studio. It's been used on stages here in Nashville. A lot of the musicians that I know, some of which you know, when they come to Nashville and they want to play my personal collection guitars, they do. Because that's why these guitars were made to be played, right? Not to be sitting in a in a closet or in somebody's collection and be tucked away. So that's the way I think about it. And so now I get 
to put the two things together. I had met the prior owner of Gibson years ago in 2009. And I always stayed connected because I wanted to see Gibson succeed. To me, Gibson represented a cultural movement, 130 years now of being part of sound and being a global sound, American sound, but global sound with the British players adopting it. And, and if you think about it, being pretty much on every record since the beginning of recorded music by virtue of being 130 years old. So when... When the opportunity came to potentially be in a in put together a group to end up taking over and acquiring the company, I jumped at it. Uh, to me, it was like a, a small window, a little probability of that happening. But to me, more than 0% of doing something with Gibson represented an opportunity. And so I jumped into it. I put together a group uh, led by a by a big private equity company that is our majority shareholder uh, called KKR that have been the most amazing stewards as shareholders of this business and what it represent for Americana history and, and so global music history. And that's how I came in to Gibson many years ago through the ownership group and have this incredible, incredible opportunity uh, that I don't take for granted, that is to put my business background together with my biggest fashion, absolute number one biggest fashion, which is not just music and guitars, but has always been Gibson. So before you was the Levi guy, right? We had another CEO, JC. Um, I was president, he was CEO, and about, I want to say six months ago, uh, the board asked me to take over. Right. I saw that. I saw the announcement. Now, during his regime, it seemed to be like Gibson was a little lost for a little bit where they were like getting into all kinds of stuff like DJ equipment and and different stuff like that. And it kind of looked like they were getting away from the guitar for a minute. Am I right on that? Yeah, that was... As I mentioned, the prior ownership group, the individuals that owned it before, had gone into consumer audio, let's call it, consumer electronics and consumer audio. And that's what led to sort of my hypothesis that maybe there's an opportunity here. There might be an opportunity here because they're, they're losing focus on what makes Gibson Gibson, which is making the best guitars you've ever made. And and maybe that's going to lead to mistakes being made that can lead to us taking over the company. That that was my hypothesis originally. And that's how this came to be. Man, it's 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 such a wild story. It's it's a lot like Harley Davidson. When you look at the history of Harley Davidson, a US company you know, they're they're strong. They win the World War II contract. Indian doesn't. Indian goes away. They're kicking ass for a long time. Then they sell to uh, AMF. They don't care about Harley. It slowly starts to go into the dirt. And then, you know, it rises out when the employees buy it and just ups and downs. And it's also ups and downs of trends. People riding motorcycles because the gas was too high. And then they stop riding because they think they're dangerous. It's a lot like that with Gibson, where you think about the 80s era where their Les Pauls were like three, four pieces of wood. They were 100 pounds. Uh, you know, there was no more yeah. nit no more nitrocelluloids. There was just bad wiring, all of that stuff. And it's um, and it all comes down to the mighty high dollar. But once you get somebody in there with some passion and and knowledge of the history, then it it uh, it really starts to turn around, and also a little thing called COVID, which blasted guitar sales through the roof. Well, that's the other thing that you just mentioned, which is, you know, in addition to the ups and downs and the different strategies that maybe owners have pursued over time, you can always go back to what we called our golden era, which is really our second golden era, which was. Well, in 1948, 
1968 under the leadership of Ted McCarty. Uh, something that I've studied since I was in my teenage years when I got so interested in everything that Gibson had done in history. And so when you start looking at that, that the playbook has been written. You know, I don't have to reinvent it. And so the ups and downs since then with different ownership groups, but ultimately that is a great playbook to what we need to be doing going forward, which, and now we have an extra level of complexity, which is what happened during that golden era was so important that really defined us. But at the same time, we need to think about what do we, how do we need to take innovation going forward and that's why we have the Gibson Lab. Like, what are we going to do to one pay tribute to our golden era? Like you said, all the 59s and all the all the classic stuff that today is highly collectible. How do we pay tribute to that while at the same time be stewards of our future so that, and this is like this is something that I find is critical, so that the best years are ahead of us and not behind us. And yeah. that is something we look at constantly. And, and we're always focused on how are we going to make, how are we going to make it very compelling, entertaining, and interesting for people to make music, to pick up a guitar, learn how to play, and write music, write and record music. And during the, there's periods that I see looking back, whether it was the first war, the second war, We've got, we recently had the COVID episode where a lot of musicians were created because people were in secluded areas, they were home, they were in protected areas. And there were a lot of musicians that came out of those situations. We have a lot of musicians that came out of COVID. It's our responsibility to make sure they stay musicians. Let me ask you this. I, uh, I was around when the... Uh, First Murphy's started to come out. Um, you know, of course, Fender comes out with the Fender Relic, the No Caster, and the Strat, and it explodes. And then Murphy kind of floats around. And, you know, I'm, I'm not even quite sure what the word is because it was such a myth, but it was like, these are going to be 50 of these 59s that Murphy's going to make and age. I think it's right, right around 1996, I bought my first one. I went down to San Diego to the uh, music store down there and uh, bought this Murphy Paul. I believe it was probably 7,500 bucks at the time, which was a lot of money. And, um, and then that, you know, those were hand aged with the razor blade and just the old school, but really cool early era. Then Murphy leaves, comes back, leaves, comes back. Once you come into the fold, is it your idea to create this Murphy lab? And do you call them up and say, hey, do you want to come back and we'll give you your own place? Yeah, that's a great question, Dean. Yes. One day... Tom shows up in my office with a brown case. It's an original lifting case. And I open up the case. And I look at this guitar. And I'm immediately, whose first is this? And is it available? Because I wanted to buy it. I, I immediately, I saw a 1959, made in 1959, Gibson, last fall. And I asked Tom, who owns this? Who owns this? I want it. I want to buy it. And he says, it's a new guitar. And that day, which was about four years ago, was when the light bulb went off. And I told Tom, after he walked me through how he did that, which is taking 30 years of, of experience and putting it all into the most incredible historic and accurate way of aging to work i said to tom tom i'm gonna build you a lab and he's like what the fuck are you talking about i was like i'm gonna build you a lab 
It's going to be called the Murphy Lab, and you're going to run it. And it's going to be a physical place. We're going to build it inside the custom shop. And I was just riffing at the time. I was imagining you were jamming, and I don't know where this is going, but I'm just, things are coming to me. And I was like, Tom, we're going to build you a lab. It's going to be called the Murphy Lab. In this lab, we're going to have math scientists that you're going to train. And you're going to do this way of making uh, age. This way of aging is the technique that you are going to do in the new Murphy lab. And he's like, I say, he's like, yeah, whatever. And we did it. And so if, if you get a chance to, well, you were there with him, Hugh, so he might have told you a little bit of part of the story when you saw him. But now we have the Murphy lab. It's been a couple of years in existence. It's a physical place inside of the custom shop that requires an extra set of credentials to go in because it's trade secret. And the Murphy Labs run by Tom Murphy full time with a group of mad scientists that are looking at original examples. They have all of my collection always available. They have photographs of my entire collection of the golden era Gibsons. And we, we scan and we photograph everybody's originals that come through. Uh, recently, I had Billy Gibbons here and we scanned and photographed early gates for the lab. And so we keep all these references and, and we have in the lab. Did, did you go inside the lab? Yes, yes, I you, saw. You saw all yeah. the guitar references that they have, right? All of which are numbered. And they have those visual references for the different different levels of aging now. And so it's been one of the most amazing experiences for me to be able to do that. And also because I think not only Tom deserves it as an individual, but I think the name needs to be in the Gibson, in the Gibson history books. And so as Tom over the next couple of years starts considering retirement, the name Murphy and the name Tom Murphy and the Murphy Lab will live forever. Were you, when you sat down and talked to him about the history of Murphy, uh, <laughs> did you get into it with him? Because, you know, early on uh, in the early 90s, there's those Murphy painted and people wanted the Murphy painted. And then at one point, they do a, a run of these first Murphy aged Les Pauls. That's the one, one of them that I got. And then they, um, they stopped doing them for a little while because he quit or whatever. But were you able to go back and look at the history of Murphy? Yep. Okay, he starts here, he starts painting here, and then aged here? A hundred percent. In fact, all the way back to the first ever 59 replica that him and Keith Medley, who's still with us, he's one of our master luthiers, they did together. And actually that guitar, I don't know if you saw it, it's a piece of white wood that is sitting next to Tom's desk, aging yeah. desk. That's the original 1993 59 replica, the most accurate at the time that we Gibson had ever done. And so yeah, all the way back to that, all the way through the history of the different things that we've done. And by the way, I had, I have some, I have several Murphys in my collection as well, from all different periods of time. And so I think, again, like I said, all of that was incredibly important. One, to know where we came from in terms of aging and, and sort of draw inspiration from all of that and learnings so that we can do the best that we've ever made and, and put our best foot forward with all that experience and collective experience. Tom, Keith Medley, Jim DeCola, uh, and a couple of our other luthiers like Doug Culberson and Matt Klein, these guys have been with us for 30 to 40 years. Wow. And so when, when you put all that experience together, it gives us a pretty unique, pretty unique perspective for the Murphy Lab that all I need to do, all really I needed to do was to recognize that. My only achievement was recognizing that and enabling this group of people to create the Murphy Lab under the leadership of Tom and then just step out of their way. Yeah, it's interesting to talk to Tom and 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 play a lot of the, uh, not a lot, but I played about 10 59s over my time. 
uh, a lot of them over at Bonamassa's house. And then, of course, the greenie and stuff. And to really talk to Tom and then see the scans of uh, of multiple, multiple 59s up there on the wall. The big, I think, uh, you know, armchair battle on the Internet always is the cut of the dish. Is it deeper? How come these are flat? And once I really talk to people and talk to Murphy and other owners, you realize different people were cutting those tops. Some guys cut them deeper to where it looked almost like a skateboard bowl. And some people, it's almost flat. And that seems to be the biggest battle over is a reissue look just like, now I'm not talking about sound. I'm talking right when you see it. Is it got the dish, everybody? You know, you tilt it, you look at it this way. But once I talk to these guys, I realize it's a lot like Japanese denim or Japanese leather jackets. This guy over here cuts them this way. This guy cuts them that way. And, you know, at the end of the day, they're, they're signed and you go, well, this guy did, you know, deep dish and the other people didn't, you know? Yeah, totally. Uh, look, I, I see when I, when I, look at all those comments it's funny right to see them because as an owner of golden era vintage les pauls from all, all the different years I, I have guitars from every year uh since the les paul got released in 1952 including several gold tops 57s and 58s and i have several 59s and they're all different every single one has a different top different carved top and it's a result of guitars being made by hand and not having a robot just sand the top down and move it to the next phase. We still do that today. We put them under belt sanders. I, I'm right now building a Les Paul. Every Friday morning I go to our factory and it's been now maybe five or six Fridays uh, for this one that I'm building now. And the most, most involved day was two weeks ago when I was, you know, before two, maybe two weeks before going out to power trip where I was actually working on that part and sending down the carved top, putting it under the belt sander and then doing a little bit by hand. And you realize how that element of handmade makes every single one different. And so as the collector, as an, as an owner of originals and Murphy's, it really all depends from the ones that we're making today, what reference we're using. Is it a particular one? Like if we do Gemini, we did Greeny, we're doing Pearly Gates, then we'll do exactly that one. But otherwise, otherwise, if it's a 59 spec, let's say custom shop could be Murphy or not, we're using a reference from the scans and we're using an average from all of the scans that we have of 59s. And so the reality is that a lot of, a lot of, I mean, these are expensive instruments. And so I completely understand people having perspectives without having ever played one. And, and, and that is because they're passionate. I take that. I'll take that people that want to engage and comment and feel passionate about it over disinterested people. And even if you've never played a 59 and you're passionate enough to put on, put on a comment and have an opinion, I'll take that. Yeah, absolutely. Because if they're not talking, then you're done, you know? And you're done. It's always uh, the famous thing that Mitzi Shore at the Comedy Store said, you want half the people to hate you and half to love you because then they're always talking about you, you know? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's, it's the same thing with the SGs. The, you know, the, this is the first, first SG, the first SG we've ever made. And it's July of 1960. This guitar doesn't come out until 1961 under the name Les Paul. And the horns on this one is a one of one. It's, we've never been, we, we, we changed it a little bit afterwards. The block here gets smaller and then it says Les Paul later. There's a lot of anomalies with this guitar, but because it's the first one and we were experimenting, we didn't then stash this in a closet. This guitar sold. Wow. That's why I have it. This guitar then was sold 
1961. So every I have guitars, SG shaped guitars from 61, 62, 63 of my 64 here as well. They're all different, every single one. So which one are you talking about when you say the horns are right or or they're wrong because they're right on some spec and they might be different from another year. But like I said, I think I love the fact that we've got music fans, guitarists and passionate people that want to talk about this because it keeps us relevant. When you start getting together with some of the celebrity players, let's say Slash, let's say Billy Gibbons, Adam from Tool, these guys, and you're you're talking to them about maybe doing collabs, uh, Kirk Hammett, Greeny. When you're really digging in with them, what is most of the uh, players, what is their concern? Like, I want this. I've been always looking for this type. Because to me, I'm, I'm totally different. My ultimate is a flyweight 59, something that weighs right under seven pounds or at seven pounds with uh, kind of that, uh, you know, Joe Perry tobacco with the with the worn out volume swell. That's to me, you know what I'm saying? But these guys are playing every day out on tour and stuff. What what were their thoughts and concerns with you? Like, here's what I'm looking for. It's, you know, it's a. That's probably the best question that you could have asked me. It is different. Every that's the beautiful thing about working with all of them is to understand what they are looking for and spend time with them to get it to the point where we can understand exactly what they are after so that we can go get it as opposed to us asking them to play what we're making. Uh, and that I think is, I mean, I, I take that very seriously. And, and we, if, you, if you talk to any of those guys, I think they'll say the same thing, which is take Adam, for example. With Adam, he has a very unique sound. Yep. And, and so first, first and foremost is looking for the sound. Second, he wants the heaviest guitars that we can possibly or humanly make. And so we have to source the heaviest maple and the heaviest mahogany that we can find around the world. We go scouting to find the heaviest woods that we can find for him and that's because he's he's used to playing those 79 silver bursts and he truly believes that it has an effect and it it, it, it is true it has an it does affect sound so in his mind the weight the finish the metallic finish uh, and then the way the guitar is built and the electronics, the profile of the neck, all the specs that make the guitar right in his hands is what we're always chasing. And we've got a good formula with him having developed the first, a couple years ago, the first 79 Silver Burst. And then from there, everything we've done with the Adam Jones collection is always preserving that Adam DNA of what he's looking for. With with Billy Gibbons, he's looking for the lightest, like you. He's looking for seven pounds, which for which we need weight relief. He's looking for that those features, and it's always, you know, the thinner necks, even thinner necks than early gates. Um, so he's looking for that comfort and that ease and that light weight. Uh, and he's always willing to experiment with finishes. We just made a less ball a super lightweight, less fall for him. We sourced paint from a custom painter that, that paints, custom paints uh, cars. It's a body shop that he's, uh, he's used in the context of his car collection. And we sourced a particular paint from them that is a transitional paint. So when you're, when Billy is in certain position, the guitar looks black. Yeah, he starts moving. He starts. It starts turning more burgundy, and then it's it all the way to a metallic red. And so it depends on lighting. It depends on how you're seeing the guitar. And he is very progressive when it comes to his thoughts about that and looking at 
different pickups and different sounds and uh, different paint finishes. And he's always experimenting. You see the, what he's done always with shapes and the headstocks. And he's always been like that. And what I love about him is that he hasn't changed. Yeah, he's, he's I mean, superstar, man. I mean, that guy, I, I witnessed him play a piece of plastic and it sounded just like Billy Gibbons, you know? Uh, just, yeah. Some of those guitars he played in the past, the Gretches, those toy guitars, the weird, uh, you know, uh, Furman amps or whatever, those little pedals and uh, just whatever he had, he just came on and it was just, you know, exact tone of just got paid. Yeah, it's all in the hands, man. It's it's fucking It's wild. in his fingers, right? And, and he uses sevens, super sevens. lightweight strings. Wow. So, so all of it, all of it, basically goes to create a sound slash is the most stoked guy and i would say kirk hammett there too those two guys who become dear friends they are stoked about talking about guitars we yeah. can spend hours talking about guitars and they'll see something on their feed and send it to me and say what is this this is amazing this is the most amazing flame top I've seen in a while and they get excited. And that is amazing to me because I get excited. It doesn't get old to me who I am in our, in our factories on a regular basis. I'm there every week. I'm looking at guitars. I'm looking at tops. I cannot help myself photographing guitars. I post sometimes the things that I'm seeing in the factory just to get it, get this tape. People like to see that, but Kirk and Slash, are into it and there i was talking to slash uh, texting back and forth this week uh about a flame top that i that i posted and he he said this just came out of my feed and it's one of the most beautiful flame tops i've seen in a long time and you know i told him it's so amazing that you still get excited he said after so so many less falls that he's seen in his lifetime that he still gets excited you know and he's always excited about guitars and to talk about guitars and so is Kirk and we'll nerd out for hours on zoom or when we're in person or on the phone and they are real real guitar nerds in the in the fan sense of the word and so you know Kirk will see something and say hey, please send it to me he'll just buy he's always buying guitars and and so is Slash we're, ma we're always making three or four new guitars for Slash there's always something being made for those two guys. They're permanently stoked. And Slash always wants a, a particular neck profile, which is more like a 58 style neck. He's, he's, he likes flame tops. He likes, uh, he also actually he likes experimenting with woods. I recently talked to him, say, well, why don't we try to make something that's all Karina? Why don't we try to make something that's a maple top, but we replace the mahogany with African mahogany, which is Korean hour. So we're always looking and experimenting and, and testing. And he's, oh, he's always got a project going also, if you think about it. Slash, when he's not with Guns N' Roses, he's on with the conspirators. If he's not with his conspirators, uh, he's doing this blues project. And he's always doing. And so there's always reasons for him to be testing guitars. And I love, about, I love that about him. He's one of the biggest guitar gods and heroes to ever live and he's still excited to talk about guitars he would be talking about guitars with us right now oh yeah i mean i'm, I'm the same way i'm a shitty player but i'm obsessed with guitars watches and mid-century homes you know those are my and it all comes down to design that's really what it is it's just all about the the aesthetics and the beauty of design when you look at yeah a lot of the Gibsons, it's the design that knocks me out. A Karina V, a Karina Explore, you know, that shit to be made in 58, it, you know, so far ahead of time. And that just, I look at the what's going on in that period of automobiles and, and homes with mid-centuries and Neutras and Frank Lloyd Wrights and everything. And those guitars to me just seem right in place when they showed them at the... Uh, you know, whatever it was at the uh, World Fair or whatever it was, <clears throat> you know, you look at those and you go, 
you know, people go like, whoa, those are so radical. And it's like, well, the cars were radical with the fins and and the homes were radical and the and the skyscrapers were radical. You know, they, the uh, the Empire State Building's radical. People were taking chances back then, you know? Totally. And uh, the bees and explorers that we designed between 1956 and 1957 and get released in 1958, Kirk has two. I know. Kirk has the 57 prototype of yeah. uh, the Flying V. There are two 57 prototypes. Kirk has one, and then he's got a 58, and he's got a 58 Explorer, and James has a 58 Explorer. And those guitars were way ahead of the shot to the point where they weren't, they really didn't work. Right. Right. And well, then they, they become the really popular later. But I think these shapes have become culturally important pieces of art that are instantly recognizable and that places a massive amount of responsibility on for me i take that personal to continue this legacy and like i said just make sure that our best years are ahead of us so that these shapes and everything that was done by gibson over 130 years of history what we're using to make and create that set of circumstances for the next 100 years. We won't be around, but we will, if, if, if anything, if I am remembered as somebody that worked to put together the right set of circumstances for Gibson to be relevant for the next 100 years, that is massive amount of success. Let me ask you a question here that I, I've, uh, it's been digging in my head for a while, and I'm not sure if you know the answer. Uh, Jimmy Page being, to me, the absolute king of all kings of Les Paul. Uh, I, I really love guys, uh, Billy Gibbons up until a point, guys where they said, that's my guitar over there. I have that one, and then I have number two in case of string breaks. But Jimmy Page is absolutely the Les Paul king. And I think it was two yeah. years ago, they had the guitar collection in the Met in New York. And I went and looked at that. I don't know if you went, but I looked at that Les Paul for a long time that was in the case. And I just don't believe that that was Jimmy's one. I think it was a replica. And, you know, I mean, I looked at the flame over and over. Do you know yourself or is that a secret or what's going on there? You know, I'm not going to avoid answering the question. And the answer is, I don't know. It was a replica that was at the Play It Loud exhibition at the Met. Um, I don't I don't recall if it was the originals or it were replicas. I've been, I spent time with Jimmy and I've had number one, number two, number three, the double neck. I've had them in my hands sitting with him. And I think that was probably one of the most insane out of body experiences that I've ever had because like you said he's the Les Paul king right he's the one he's the one that made the Les Paul what it is yep. and you know when you ask slash he says Jimmy Page yeah and and even if you ask Billy and and kind of even they, they kind of overlapped in the same era he will say the same thing and just Seeing those two, those instruments, number one, number two, number three, number three is the one that was refinished in that candy apple red. Yeah, uh, and apparently cool. had two red ones, and it seems to be a mystery. There's an early red one that kind of goes away, and then the candy apple red changes around 77. Uh, he, buys the, he buys the number three already refinished. Right. Uh, it's actually, uh, I can't remember now, it's a 68 or a 69, less fall. Uh, we have everything documented, I just don't remember now. And, but number one and number two, if you, if you go back to your original statement, those two guitars defined however many decades, and, and I don't think that's ever gonna stop. It's, it's, it's gonna be an influence in music that I think, and I hope, continues to live forever. Um, I get excited when I see young kids learning Led Zeppelin riffs, learning anything from Metallica to Guns N' Roses, but Metallica and Guns N' Roses are still touring. We just got a chance to see them. But when I see 
young kids, my 14 year old, when he was 11 or 12 years old, learning Led Zeppelin riffs. And I see other kids, those that are in that age bracket that are learning Led Zeppelin riffs. It almost gives me goosebumps to even talk about it because it's the most rewarding experience that I've had seeing the young generation of players uh, want wanting to play like Jimmy Page. Yeah. It, it, let me ask you this. There was the Jimmys that came out, and I guess was it what? Late 90s, early 2000s that had the switches under the pick guard. And then you did a Jimmy a few years back. Um, I'm, I'm correct on that, right? Yeah, there were there were custom shop reissues of his. Uh, yeah, he's got those mods where he's got the switches under the pick guard. Um, yeah, those were done, I want to say, about 20 years ago or so, maybe 15 years ago. Um, but they were done without scans. Right. They were done with, with manual measurements. They are amazing instruments. Um, I've played them. They're really wonderful, insane. Um, in the future, if we ever do something within, we've got everything scanned. Wow. Wow. Now, let's get into a little bit about what happened with the Tower Records building. At one point, you guys bought that, am I right? And you were going to make that kind of a uh, a, a spot where the, the celebrity players could come in. You could do kind of uh, showcases and film and stuff. Am, am I right on that? And then, and then COVID hit and it kind of just sat there. Well, that was before. So, so you're right. When we ended up doing the, the acquisition of the company, let's say, just to call it as a moment in time, right? Just think about mid 2018, let's call it that the acquisition period where we come over, Gibson owned the Tower Records lease in LA. And that was prior owner had done, had taken over that lease. And the intention was to make it a, like a private performing area, showcase area, um, in addition to having in LA what we still have today, which is the private showroom, which is for artists and sort of friends where they can go rehearse, they can go create content. We do a lot of Gibson TV um, content there. It's basically a combination of our office space and studio. And when we took over the company, we, we realized <clears throat> owning and operating a, a, a venue was not our strength. And again, just think about losing focus and all the things you can start saying yes to. I think one of the, the most important things that we always need to be doing is learn what to say no to so that we can say yes to the things that really matter. And the things that really matter to us is making the best guitars we've ever made in our history, making the best amplifiers we made in the history of Mesa Boogie, taking care of our people who are our best assets, our craftsmen and women in the factories. And so at the time we decided, you know what? It's a really sexy thing if we did that, but what do we need to say no to so that we can say yes to the things that really matter to us? And that was one, so we let go of that lease. Yeah, cutting the fat, basically, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's there, there are partners that what they do, their core competency is to run venues. Well, great, right? Somebody should do that, and we can partner. We partner with so many of them around the world. We need to focus on making the best guitars we've ever made, have the best relationships with our artists around the world, and take care of our people so that we can continue this tradition of hand-making American-made instruments that can then take a journey around the world so that people can use them to create music forever. And that is, that is what we always need to think about. And there's so many distractions, right? There are so many things that are interesting, intriguing, that we were, oh, I wish I could do that, but come back to what is the core of our strategy. And then you realize when you do that and take a reset, let's bring it back home. 
I was around Boogie in the early 80s. Uh, my guitar player worked at the factory. I was there 81, 2, 3, 4, you know, uh, around Randall, Doug West, all those guys. And um, it's really interesting to me. I don't think that Randall gets the the glory that he should. Him, I would say he's probably the original boutique amp builder. And then you got Dumble. But, you know, nobody was doing what Randy was doing back then. No. Uh, you, know, you, you, had, you had Marshall, you had Fender, you had Peavy. This guy is in Petaluma in a fucking warehouse whipping up these combo amps and eventually creating what would be known as Metallica's full-blown triple rectifier, that whole tone of crunch. It became the, the thrash metal crunch from Santana and, and, and uh, Keith Richards to Metallica and, and Exodus and all those guys. It's wild. Totally, man. I mean, I, it's, I'm glad you're going there because Randy, who's still with us, by the way, he's still working and designing amplifiers. So is Doug West, who you mentioned. So is Jim Ascho and Steve Mueller and John Marshall, who played, if yeah. you think about John Marshall, he's been with us for 26 or 27 years at, at Mesa Boogie. And he's the guy, he's the only guy who's toured with Metallica playing, um, you know, replacing James in the Master of Puppets tour when he had the skateboard accident and during the Black Album tour when he got burned. John is still with us. In fact, I have here, you don't see it, but I have here a triple rectifier that John just made for me that I'm testing. It's uh, it's all handwritten. All the controls are handwritten by him. It's a new triple rectifier that I'm testing. And so you think about, there's an amazing story that Randy always tells me I, 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 poor guy, I always ask him to tell me a story, even though I heard it a hundred times. I just love it so much. He goes, he, he, he files for a patent on a design yeah, back, you know, 40 years ago. And the guy in the pad, the engineer in the patent office calls him up and says, may I speak with Randall Smith? He's like speaking. Well, sir, I wanted to let you know that your drawing uh, has a mistake in it. And Iran is like, what's the problem? Well, the way that you've designed the circuit board in this wiring diagram, you're going to have a problem with this amplifier. It's going to distort. <laughs> That's fucking funny. And I, and, and I love that story because that was the whole point. Obviously, Randy filed for something that he could he figured out would create gain and would overdrive it. And this engineer in the patent office calls Randy saying, sir, this is going to overdrive. There's yeah. a mistake here. And Randy is the guy who created gain. Man. People don't know that, but he's the guy who created gain. He's the first one who files for a patent on a, of an amplifier with gain. Man. And then everybody else adopts it. So from then, the story then, you know, when Kirk and James go to the factory and then they start testing the Mark II C plus and they take, they end up, they both end up taking one each. Um, James ends up loving Kirk's more than ever. And that becomes the crunch berry that we all know. Right. So that became the crunch berry, but it's a modified, it's a, it's a C plus plus. So instead of the two C plus, there's an extra mod on gain, which is very simple to do. Uh, that becomes the sound of master of puppets onwards. Right. And so that defined, like you just said, it just defined thrash metal and all the guys in the Bay area start using it. And and it became the sound, it's right? Just, and so it's just as important as the JCM and the Plexi. It's it's in the line. You go Plexi, JCM, triple rectifier. I mean, that's the history, right? And that's not even a triple. That's a yeah. that is a Mark II C plus plus. Right. The triple that the rectifier comes after that, or around the same time they're developing the rectifier, the dual rectifier, and then the triple rectifier. And uh, and and that became the sound of, I guess it became the sound of the 90s 
80s and 90s, the, the 80s was with the, the, the C++, um, even all the way to back to where it all got started, Randy was modifying amps, for example, for Santana, and that's how the whole thing started, where he builds an amplifier from scratch that became the Mark I for Carlos. We have that amplifier here in our vault, that first one. And that's when Carlos hears, it's 150 watts, by the way, it's a 150 watt combo. And Carlos listens to that sound and he immediately says to Randy, this thing has the boogie. And at the time, the company, Randy had filed it as M-E-S-A. And it became Mesa Boogie after Carlos says, this thing has the boogie. That's how the name Mesa Boogie comes to be. Keith Richards listens to that amplifier when they invite, in 1977, the Stones invite Carlos to sit in with them at the Madison Square Garden. Yeah. Now, Carlos yeah. takes that amplifier with him and gets, gets in a taxi with Bob Dylan. The two of them get in a cab. They put the amplifier in the middle between them and they head to the garden. Carlos shows up with that thing we weighs like a ton. It's a little amplifier. It's 150 watts. The transformer is heavy. He, they plug that in, and Keith looks at him and says, Randy tells this story. He always said I wasn't there. Says, Keith, what are you doing with this little thing? We're playing the garden. Uh, sorry, Carlos, what are you doing with this thing? And Carlos says, Keith, just wait. And they sound check, and he hits the note. And the thing sustains throughout the garden at sound check for so long that after that session, the sound check session, they go backstage. They call Randy, and that's when the Stones, that's when Keith starts using and places the first order of Mesa Boogies. They, and then imagine Keith, he just rolls over and he's like, hey, mate, our time's tough. You can't afford a real amp. I could buy you one, man. You know? <laughs> yeah. I yeah. can buy a real amp. Get that fucking thing backstage where it belongs. It's a practice amp. He was laughing at Carlos, saying, what are you doing with this ball thing here? We're playing the garden. And then when Carlos plays 150 watts and the sustain of that amplifier blew his mind. Yeah. Do you? It absolutely blew his mind. Do you think it's a risky uh, purchase to in this world now of what's really happening uh, with the fractals and the line sixes and also the the world of clubs when you play a club and the and the sound man just says he keeps saying turn down turn down turn down and the traveling musicians that are doing fly-ins do you think people in five years from now are still going to be buying actual tube amps other than studio usage well, it's a great question. I think the there's two things there with your question. One is there's a certain amount of sound DNA and IP with Mesa Boogie that we have, that we work with uh, all of these uh, companies that you just mentioned, right? Whether it's Neural, Neural or Fractal or anyone that is looking at the Mesa Boogie sounds and wants to use them. We welcome that, and we work with all of them. Uh, we have a great partnership with IK Multimedia, and they have so many of our plugins, Mesa Boogie plugins that you can download. Same is the case with Neural and, and other companies. That, that That is something that by virtue of owning Mesa Boogie, we're going to be able to continue to do and work with all these digital platforms and profilers that want to use the Mesa Boogie sounds, whether it's the actual amp heads and the actual amplifiers, but also the cabs, because the cabs are as famous for Mesa Boogie as our amps. And so that is, that's in a way, something that de-risks, to answer your question, de-risks it because we actively work with all of them and they license our sounds. And then our sounds, we are not a volume if we're not making them in volume. You know, we like you said, it's more a boutique. I I think about Mesa Boogie more as our custom shop. It's 
similar to our Gibson custom shop, what we do at Mesa Boogie. And so it's a smaller business. Um, and I think my experience has been that it's continues to be highly relevant, that a lot of musicians, including young musicians, are now exploring where did this sound come from? You know, they're hearing profiles and sounds and plugins and downloads. And there's always a percentage of those musicians that have that intellectual and musical curiosity to say, where did this come from? Because I'm liking what I'm hearing. Where's the original sound? And we are seeing they're going to amplifiers. Wow. Maybe when they tour, then they create their own profiles and they download them into their quad cortexes and the new IK media sonics and the, the fractals and the campers. But they are continuing to explore with amplifiers. Our artists continue to want to explore with amplifiers. And I think that that's continuing to feed the search for this tube sound while at the same time the tube sound expands exponentially around the world in many ways, thanks to IK Multimedia, Neural, Fractal, Kemper, that make those sounds available to everybody. I, th I mean, I'm 57. I don't know how old you are, but I've seen, it, it all comes around. It's just like, you know, vinyl's out, the, the, the CD's in, now vinyl's back. You know, we go back to uh, amps, then it was solid state, then it was rock mans, then it was back to combos and boutiques, matchless. Mark Sampson explodes that market. You get into the uh, divided by 13s and, and that whole thing was going on and Dumble. And then now we're at the fractal and stuff. And, and a lot of that has to do with the practicality of flying around. And as uh, Kirk said on my podcast, you know, also has to do with different wattages and biases uh, and traveling and the amps just getting beat up and all that. So we've seen it come and go. And, and you know, five years from now, people will be like, you know, fuck all that. I just want an amps up here, you know, so... I think it's it depends on on the level of touring as well. I think the for a band like Metallica, it just makes makes sense if you think about the different rooms they play, whether it could be a stadium or a big arena, and being able to have that consistency of sound beyond the logistical part of it and potentially damaging it because obviously everything can be fixed and replaced. There's a space constraint, and then there's a room element for the sound that they want to deliver to have that consistency. And so they, when you look at it, and you've been to Metallica HQ, when, when you look at what they have in the room and how they're profiling, it all, it all is ultimately coming from the real amplifiers. And so I, I actually welcome that because they are making the sound available and there's all these people out there listening to the Metallica sound and wanting to find out where did it come from. And so they end up finding their way back to Mesa Boogie. So it, it's it's actually a really beneficial thing that we have these um, digital modules uh, where you can profile, and it's so easy to profile. It's so intuitive now, especially with you know the ones that I've I've used now, uh, IK and Neural. And it's just so easy to use. It's basically like a, a touchpad, right? It's a touchscreen, and so it's it's just making it available. And we work with them and they are our partners. And so you, when you're using those platforms, you're, you're downloading the Mesa Boogie plugins. Right. So to me, that, that is, that is a win-win. Yeah. And I, I want to explain to people that uh, are not deep gear nerds. Basically these are digital types of uh, amplifiers to where they can sample say the sound of master of puppets record so metallic can go back and forth in the black album here's the sad but true amp here is the uh you know disposable heroes amp here's uh trapped under ice and with with a flick of the button they have all those sounds in one night while you're seeing them and uh it's pretty interesting to see i do think and i've been on stage when these bands are using them i do miss the air movement there's something about tube amps and also the squishiness when you hit it like a kabow you know of the way it goes through the tube amps it comes out of the speakers i do miss that throw 
Yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, so do I. And I, and I, when I see they play smaller venues, when they do these like smaller shows that are, uh, that give them the ability to bring amplifiers, you see them use amplifiers, right? And so they're, they're always wanting to go make the most of opportunities where they can. Right. Yeah. I, I played with Kirk and Rob in the wedding band. Oh, we so use yeah. amplifiers. Yeah, yeah, we use the amplifiers. Yeah. And so whenever we can, whenever they can, they use them. Uh, but but like I said, I mean, these profilers are amazing because because you just explained each sound for each song can be already profiled and delivered to the audience in a way that can be replicated everywhere in the world. And look, we're early on in it. Five years from now, it's going to be so mind boggling that you're yeah. just going to be like, yeah, I, I mean, I have these digital streaming speakers from Diavel, uh, D, what are they? Diavel, Diavel, I forget the name. They're from France and they're so insane. You know, like I, I closed my eyes for a week straight before vinyl and streaming. And I was like, all right, this is, this is great. You know? And yeah. uh, so everything's just, it, it just gets better and better and better. And also yeah. in a world of uh, me wanting to be a minimalist, a fractal or something like that, it's just genius. You don't have a house full of gear anymore, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And and you, the, by virtue of being able to profile your amplifier, say, say I have my rig, right? And I have this triple rectifier and my Mark 7. And I like the two working together. I can profile that and take that sound of those two amplifiers working together. And that could be one of my sounds. And so that's really, that's really amazing. And for us as, as Gibson and Mesa Boogie and having the Mesa Boogie sounds that everybody wants to use gives us the advantage because we can then showcase our sounds through those platforms to everyone around the world. Now, we just came back from Power Trip, and you see Metallica using profilers like they use and they're known. And right before Metallica, Tool was playing amplifiers. Yeah, yeah with diesel, and, yeah, diesels and a Marshall up there. Right, and so he had he had the diesel, he had the Marshall, he had the triple rec. He was going through Mesa cabs and a Marshall cab. You got Justin that was playing his Ampex. He was actually playing through Mesa Boogie cabs. So you got one band with one formula, and then the next band had a different formula, and they both sounded epic. Absolutely. It was an amazing experience. Absolutely. There was no, I'll tell you, live sound and, and bands, the gear and the live sound, have finally kind of caught up to each other. And then the video visuals concerts right now are such a mind boggling experience. Whether it be the sphere, you know, happening with you two, yeah. I'm looking forward to bands like tool going in there and, and doing a residency for like five, six days and having yeah. theme graphics up there, you know, like it's the concert world. And, and like I said, the equipment, it's just getting insane. Yeah, that's the first thing I thought. It's funny you say that. When I saw the footage of you two at the Sphere, my first thought was, I want to see Tool in there. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I would have loved to have seen Pink Floyd in there. Oh. But imagine a band like Tool playing the Sphere, where there's no... With Tool, you never see the cameras pointing at the individuals, right? It's always a... It's always a show, as much as it is the show of what they do live, it's also the video show they put on, the live show, content, the artwork. So it was actually my first thought after I saw the footage. It's like, I want to see Tool in there. Same here, same here. Can you tell me, did you guys track down those uh, Adam Jones uh, Les Pauls that got stolen from the truck at the truck stop? A few of them we ended up being able to get back. Um, we you know, we still engaged with them and had, had you know we got we got to work with the FBI on that. So there's not a lot I can say about it, but it was a really interesting situation. Um, you know, a really negative circumstance 
that became something that people talked about so much that it, it, it almost elevated the story. Yeah, and it gave us, <laughs> yeah, it gave us the opportunity to obviously made them. And I, in talking to Adam, I was like, Adam, we should do something really cool because we got to remake 13 guitars. And these guitars, we could make them to be the most special ones in the run because we can put some, an identifier on them. And, and so knowing, you know, uh, Tool and Adam writes, they, they write a lot in seven. They are the anchor time signature is, is seven. So those, those guitars we made with the same serial numbers, but we added a dot seven at the end. Wow. 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 Let me ask you this. My favorite uh, Angus SG is um, the back and black one. Now that's a, uh, over the years, it's been modified a zillion times. It was a three pickup custom. Uh, it was walnut at one time, I believe with gold hardware, they stripped it, pulled the middle one out, put that full bat wing on, which is just beautiful. And there it is. It's the classic Angus inside the back and black where he's sweating and you're seeing that guitar. And uh, even on the gear rundown, when the guy goes, here it is, the Holy Grail. Look, I just got goosebumps, dude. It, it, me too. It fucks with me so hard, that guitar. He only played it like two songs at Power Trip, which I was kind of uh, bummed on. Yeah. That thing, is there any plans to do an identical replica of that guitar? Because I was at the factory and they're like, what's your dream guitar? And I said, well, the Joe Perry and then the Angus back in black. Look, we are working with, actively with Angus right now. Um, they were rehearsing in LA and my team was there before Power Trip. And um, all I can tell you is that he's engaged. <laughs> you did do the Gibson did do the one with the lightning bolts years back, but it was the small pick guard and it's not yeah. the back and black one, man. That is yeah. the one yeah. for everyone. I mean, every guitar nerd, I guarantee if you went to Kirk Cam and you went, we're doing the back and black one, he goes, Oh dude, I want no, to. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's one of those things that I get all the time and, and you're, you're, you're talking about one of the most iconic guitars in, in guitar history. And A Angus has been hard to pin down. And, but, you know, we're, we're actively talking and he's been amazing. So we'll see if, the, if it leads to us doing it. Um, we would love that, obviously. Know that from my perspective, I think, as a tribute to him and to making that available to all us fan freaks around the world, that would be epic. And there's other instruments that are like that, right? I mean, that it, it really is a matter of finding the right time with the artist. We don't like, we don't like pursuing and pressuring. We like developing organic relationships. You know, in, in, in the years that I've been friends with Kirk, for example, I never asked him once. He told me, hey, I'm ready to start working on something together. And so that's the approach is, is playing the long game and working with artists in a way that is organic without ever trying to force them into something that they might not be ready to do. And so sometimes we have to be patient. Yeah. Well, uh, I can't thank you enough for talking to me. And, you know, I was out at the, I was at the factory a year ago today, uh, this week, actually, because I was on tour with Marcus King. We were at the Ryman. And we were there two days, so I had a, a daytime to get over there. And it was great to finally meet Tom Murphy. I had, you know, owned one of the early Murphys. I sold it to move to L.A. years ago, and I miss it more than anything, you know. And I don't even really remember the serial number. It was so long ago, you know. But uh, I, I'm fascinated by Gibson's. I've I, I've I've looked at them. I've played them. I've studied them since I was probably in uh, fifth grade. And, you know, to be at the factory is, uh, you know, it was a dream. And also to be part of some of the Gibson videos with uh, Mark being able to uh, shoot, yeah. shoot them about the Troubadour or anything like that. And, and you know, I interviewed Nikki Six at the L.A. Uh, uh, office. 
And it, you yep. know, a lot of great history there. And, you know, bottom line is we all love guitars, whether it be. So well, you've, become, you've become part of the Gibson family and you're, you're so into it. You have all these relationships with our team, with our artists um, that obviously you've become ingrained with us. And so we always welcome the opportunity to do things with you. And there's one of the coolest things that you've ever done. I think you've ever done was. Who can say they did a tribute to ACDC with Scott Ian, Nikki Six, and Bill Burr on drums? Yeah. That's a badass motherfucker. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to do it again in January if you want to come out. I want to come out because I love Scott. He's one of my favorite humans on the planet. Obviously, I love you and I love ACDC. So, I mean, the, it's, Scott, man, that guy has studied Malcolm's parts. He's 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 amazing the way he pays tree to Malcolm. You can sing, which is a, ver a virtue that very few have. Yeah. And the 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 band when you guys put all, all that out, the footage was so amazing. In January, if you're doing it, I'm coming. Well, our dream is to get Slash and Kirk Hammett. We haven't had either of them. We've had all kind. I mean, you know, it's a. It's a rotating of who's who, man. Yeah. Scott Ian, uh, you know, Scott from Rival Sons, who's fucking unreal. Amazing. Uh, Murr from Primus, who has his own SGs now, which is sick. And, uh, you know, uh, George Lynch has played. It, it, it's yeah. just numerous guys on the drums. Brad Wilk from Rage. Scott, uh, Steve Gorman, who's one of the greatest drummers ever. So, yeah. It's a uh, a thing I've been doing for many, many, many years, and it's my deep love of ACDC and comedy because we do comedy before the show. So it's, uh, you know, comedy yeah. and then rock. There's nothing better than comedy and rock. That's a tour bus right there. You're laughing that was, and you go play rock. That's it. That's it. And I was there when you did the 40th anniversary of Metallica. So that's when I played with the wedding band afterwards. And I think that's a perfect combination. If you do it in if you do it in January, I mean, we can always reach out to Kirk and Slash and see if they're available. Slash just announced uh, the tour with the conspirators that he can fit in at the beginning of the year. So depending on timing, let's see if we can make it happen because those guys, well, Slash is always around LA when he's got downtime, yeah. and Kirk is always moving around. It would be it would be so rad. Yeah, it's a dream to have those two guys on because. You know, this isn't some fucking throwaway party. This is full on like a rock concert, man. It is. Oh, yeah. And we go. At if, if people, if, if your viewers on the podcast haven't seen it, I encourage them to go check it out. It's awesome. It was great, man. It was uh, great to talk to you. And uh, I, I always enjoy seeing you around out there. You love rock like myself. And uh, thank you so much for doing the show. And uh tell everybody where to find you on instagram and and all that yeah thank you. by the way thank you for having me i mean you've interviewed everyone so i don't even know why you wanted to interview me but uh, thank you nonetheless and uh check us out on all the gibson channels uh, at gibson guitar uh, around all social platforms and me personal is at quakian which is my last name and i'm always trying to keep it interesting can you tell him, uh, spell that real quick for him? Yeah, it's G-U-E-I-K-I-A-N, uh, which is my last name, and it's the handle on socials for the things that I try to do to keep it interesting and a little different. Also go to YouTube, and you can see uh, his entire collection. Mark Agnese uh, goes to his house and looks at his whole collection, including this ancient, like, 1928 uh Steinberg the piano that got rebuilt which is pretty cool and oh yeah dining room yeah <laughs> yeah Gibson TV has uh, has a lot of cool stuff that we've done across icons and the process the pro if you're interested in seeing how we make guitars there's a whole season one of how we make electric guitars uh the process and we're now about halfway through on how we make acoustic guitars Wow. Uh, out there in Montana still? Yeah. Still in Bozeman, Montana. Very cool. All right. Thank you, man. Thanks for doing the show. There you guys go. Another episode of Let There Be Talk. And uh, 
all kinds of guitar talk there. So thank you for tuning in. Subscribe, leave a review on iTunes and YouTube. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Dean. See you, man.